So today we're going to wrap up our unit on work, energy, and power by talking about the only one of those things that we haven't covered yet, which is power. So, as is often the case, the uh, physics definition of the word power is different than the colloquial usage of the word anyway. Physics has a very, very specific meaning for the word power in that it is something that we can measure and calculate and you know, the power companies measure the power that you use in there. Really, they measure the energy. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But anyway, power is really just a rate. You guys have been doing rate problems since you were two or three years old. Uh, the rate at which anything happens or anything is done is simply that thing divided by time, right? And so power you can think of, there's a couple ways that I like to think of it. It's the rate at which work is done. So if we're thinking of it in terms of that, the equation I could just write as power, which is capital P, is equal to work, capital W, over time. That's not what's on the formula sheet. I'll go over what's on the formula sheet in a minute. But uh, if you're doing work, you know, you're exerting a force on an object, and that object is covering some displacement in response to the force. You divide that by the amount of time it takes you to do that work. That's your power. You can think of it in terms of like power output. That's the power output of your, your muscles and your biological self as you do the work. If you're talking about the force that an engine is responsible for providing on your car to get it to move a certain distance, the power output of the car engine. Um, yeah, so it's just the, the rate at which work is done. We can also think of it as the rate at which energy is used slash transferred. What do I mean by transferred? Well, when we do work, the process of doing work, it can change the energy according to the work kinetic energy theorem. Right? If I do work on an object, and well, if network is done on an object, that network just translates into the change in kinetic energy of the object. So you can, you can do work, um, you can do work on an object and, uh, and get its energy to change, or you can just transfer it from one type of energy to another. Right? As an object falls, energy is transferred from gravitational potential energy to kinetic energy as the object falls. In response to the force of gravity doing work, the rate at which that energy is transferred is just power. Same thing. So the way it's written on the formula sheet kind of kind of emphasizes this definition. It's really the same definition, but it's written like this. Power is change in, in general, change in energy over, and because the college board, when they write these formula sheets, they like being inconsistent, they put that over delta T. Whereas in the kinematic equations and the equations for momentum that we'll learn, they just use T. But for some reason, for the power equation, they use delta T. Just understand in both cases, it's just time interval. Right? That's what you say in your brain when you see a T or delta T on the formula sheet, time interval. Delta T, we just assume that T naught is zero. And so final T minus initial T is just final T. Now this delta E, as I already pointed out, this delta E here could be delta K. According to the work energy theorem, network being done on an object will change its kinetic energy. So this change in energy here, that, this is more general. It does cover more situations. Because I could put network in for the change in energy over time. I could put change in kinetic energy in for the change in energy over time. I could put, because we also have an equation, for change in gravitational potential energy. That's just mg delta y. So if I'm lifting an object, or if I myself am walking up a flight of stairs, I am increasing my gravitational potential energy, that can be thought of as the change in energy in the equation for power. And I just divide that by time, and I can figure out the power output of my, my leg muscles. Right? So it's pretty, it's, it's pretty simple. Uh, this is the confusing part. 
just figuring out what you can put in there for delta E, but you can literally put in any equ equation describing work or energy transfer, energy change, change in energy. So it could be work, could just be the delta, it could be a work done by a single force. You can have four forces doing work on an object, and each one of those four forces would have a, a, its own power output. But then if I'm talking about the work energy theorem, then I find the network done by those forces. That will be the change in kinetic energy of the object. And that would then tell us the net power output um, on the object. Cool beans? All right. So one of the more common types of problems that you can see here when we're talking about work and energy and power, I mean power in general, is the uh, going up the stairs, up the stairs. So if I'm going to walk up the stairs, which are large stairs, and I get to the top here, I'm going to define the lowest point as zero. So I'll call that y naught is zero. And then my final position y would be that. And so I know that change in energy is mg delta y. So if I want to know the power output of my legs as they're providing the force necessary for me to move up, I would just say the power is going to be the change in potential energy over the time interval. And change in potential energy is just mg delta y. mg delta y over the time interval. And of course, if, del if y naught is zero, this is literally just mg times y. Or if you like thinking in terms of mg times height, that's fine as well. The height up above your starting point that you get to um, will dictate the change in potential energy and can be written like this. Now, this should make sense to those of you that work out. Because if I look at this number here, it doesn't change. Mg doesn't change, at least not in the process of going upstairs. If you go up the stairs a lot over a certain amount of time because you're trying to lose, lose the gut, like I sometimes have to do, then, uh, then yeah, you're going to change. But one time up the stairs is not going to change your Mg. Why? It's not going to change as you go from the bottom of a certain flight of stairs up to the top. What can change here is the time. This is why people that are more fit and stronger can get up the stairs faster. Because they can have a large, not, they do the same amount of work, right? Two people that are the same mass, they do the same amount of work to get up to the top of the stairs. But the person that's fitter, that has stronger leg muscles, can get up the stairs faster. Because the person that is stronger can have a larger power output, right? As delta T goes down, meaning I got to the stair, top of the stairs faster, the time interval is smaller. When I divide a number by a smaller number, I get a bigger number. So the power output, even though you're doing the same amount of work, the power output for the person that gets to the top of the stairs faster is going to be larger. And that requires larger muscles and stronger muscles. I'm always, call me nerd, I go to the Rocky Mountains pretty much every summer and I climb at least one 14er. And I'm thinking about this the entire way up because it's brutal torture to climb a 14er if you're an old man like me and not as fit as some of you guys. But the whole time I'm thinking, I'm thinking about what, what are my power up? I'm a huge nerd too, but, but yeah. Um, Cause that's like climbing up stairs for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. Uh, but then the view's amazing, so anyway. So power output, MGY over delta T if you're talking about an object changing elevation. Um, note, that, well, I'll just tell you, a lot of example problems involve stairs. A lot of example problems involve weightlifting. Um, what doesn't matter, at least when we're not talking about very, very specific things going on inside the person's body, what doesn't matter is the horizontal distance travel when you're climbing stairs. What doesn't, and, and the, the reason that really doesn't matter is because really when you're moving up, you're fighting against gravity. That's why most people can walk around on horizontal ground all day long, all day long and not get tired. The instant you start climbing uphill, that's when you start to get tired. Because then you're fighting against gravity, right? Gravity's pulling down, so you have to do an amount of work upwards in order to give yourself 
potential energy. Right? If I'm walking horizontally, my potential energy isn't changing. Really, the only, the only thing I'm doing is fighting gravity from making me fall to the ground. Right? It doesn't require nearly as much work. So the well, horizontal motion really doesn't matter. And we've already kind of talked about that, but now I'm going to elaborate on it just a little. When we were talking about conservative forces, this is on the way up Mount Yale, by the way. That was a 14er two years ago I did. Okay. So just like the work done by gravity on these two objects is the same, even though this guy's sliding down a ramp, the work we know done by gravity is going to be the same because they're both going to ex experience the same change in kinetic energy. They both start from rest. The one that's falling straight down ends up with about 7.7 .7 meters per second. So all the gravitational potential energy turned into kinetic. They both start with the same gravitational potential energy. This guy's got a kinetic energy. They have the same mass. This guy's got a kinetic energy based on a 7.7 .7 meter, meter per second velocity. And sure enough, this guy takes him longer. But sure enough, that guy, when he gets down there, has 7.7 .7 meter per second velocity. So same kinetic energy. So the same amount of work was done by the gravitational force regardless of the path taken. So it doesn't matter if you're going up the stairs or if you're walking up an incline or if you pull yourself up a rope. Why is it so much more difficult to pull yourself up a rope a certain height than it is to walk up a certain height, that same height of stairs? Yeah. Kind of, but it more has more to do with these and these. What well, muscles are stronger, your leg muscles or your arm muscles? Your leg muscles, and then your hand muscles. Most people can't actually pull themselves up a rope because their grip strength is, is not, not strong enough, right? Most, pe most people don't have good grip strength. What's that? If you're doing it right, normally, you use your legs to pull yourself up. Right, but you also have to, you also have to have the grip strength. I watched it. They did a thing where they, um, they gauge. They just measured how long it took, or how long people could just hang from a bar. The average person, it's like far less than a minute. But then you get your average rock climber. Your average rock climber can over two minutes, because rock climbers have crazy strong hands. I used to do it before COVID. At the gym. Anyone go to Summit Climbing Gym ever? Ah, oh, it's good times. It's good times. Anyway, so the work done by gravity. Now you might say, but there's normal force acting on this guy when he's going down. So what about the work done by the normal force? What about the work done by the normal force? What well, what'll be the same? Gravity does the same amount of work on both of these, but what about the work done by the normal force? Shouldn't that affect things? No. Why not? It's perpendicular direction of motion, so it does no work. So that's another reason that it should become, maybe not obvious, but a little more clear, that they should have the same change in energy. Unless there was friction. If there's friction, now friction is going to do negative work, and that's going to reduce the total amount of energy. Mechanical energy. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And so then you would expect this guy to not have the same speed when he got to the ground. This works in reverse though. This works in reverse and is the basic idea behind all simple machines that you learned about when you were little kids in middle school. Because uh, this is an incline, incline plane, right? I could, there's a 200 pound box here, I could lift it up and put it here. And it would be, 200 pounds is not, is not a small amount of weight. It wouldn't be comfortable. I don't even know if I could do it at this point. Or I could just get an incline plane and slide it up. And it would be much easier to slide it up the inclined plane, right? Than it would be to lift it the same height. Notice that in both cases, they both gain the same amount of potential energy. So you do the same amount of work in both cases. That's why simple machines don't just magically make you stronger or that magically make energy, the energy requirements different. They just change the amount of force required. Because if I'm sliding an object up a, up a, up a ramp, then the amount of force required is smaller, but then the distance required to travel is larger. So as the force goes down, the distance goes up, and you end up doing the same amount of work. Generally, if I was just to pick that box and put it up here, it wouldn't take that long. It will take much longer to push it up 
uninclined plane. Therefore, the power output will also be smaller for pushing it up the inclined plane than it would be to just lift it up because it would take more time. More time, less power output. So all simple machines work on those principles. Simple machines work on the principle of smaller force, larger distance. Even if you're talking about prying the, the bottle cap off of a bottle, one not a twist off one, one you have to, have to use a, a bottle opener for. Bottle openers, what they do, if you just, there's some people that can do this, just grab it and pry it off, right? There's a few people that I've seen been able to do that. Um, if you're doing that, you're exerting a very large force, but it, over a very tiny diff, distance, right? You just pop it in the top, very tiny distance. You get a bottle opener and you put it on there and then you actually have to move your hand over a much larger distance. Requires much less force, but you gotta go over a, a much larger distance. Um, usually takes more time. So uh, smaller power output, same amount of work, smaller power output and requires less force. And I probably should have put, I'm talking about that. Probably should have put the equation for work over here. Because I could write this as work, force ty times displacement times the cosine angle between them, divided by 10. So I can always expand the power equation out to this because that is the equation for work, right? Yep. And so again, simple machines, they essentially increase the distance over which you exert that force, which requires then less force to do the same amount of work and usually changes the time it takes. Do uh, you remember learning about compound pulleys? Yeah, it takes longer, but you use a lot less force. Exactly, exactly. I could, I could have a thousand pound box here, box of weights. And if I just push the rope, attached to a rope, put it on a compound pulley system where I got two, three, four, five, six, any number of pulleys, the more pulleys, the less force. But then you end up pulling the rope down like this and the box barely moves up, right? So you're exerting much less force, but you're pulling on that rope much longer than you would if you were to just pull on a single pulley, right? Put it over a single pulley and just pull down. Well, that means it's just like, you could, you could lift like a ton. Yeah. It's just huge, right? Yeah, yeah. The more pulleys, the, the more weight you can lift. So it's, you just gotta make sure the support, mm -hmm. think supporting the pulley is strong enough to, yeah. to not, you know, break. Okay. Right. So it kind of makes sense? Time, Bring back some middle school stuff? The time can, thing can kind of get out of hand. Like, if you, if you add enough, to, like, like, this, like, like 100 pulleys is like, if you, if you like, yeah, that would be that would be ridiculous. At that point, you might as well just buy something that, yeah. some mechanical device right. that uses electricity to do the work. Well, one rotation for the last pulley will have to be in between the second. That's like a gear, there's there's a gear setup a video on YouTube a guy a gear setup where it takes like many trillions of rotations on this side to get this gear to rotate yeah, once. It, it might have been that one. And he like started winding it up and had to cool it down because it was like, yeah, yeah. It's it good stuff. Totally, totally impractical. Okay. Um, so any questions about this so far? Kind of understand? Again, if you know work and energy, it's not that much of a stretch. The difficulty just lies in, as you'll see when you start working the problems, what, is, what do I put in for delta E? Is it going to be the work, like FD cosine theta, is it going to be the change in kinetic energy? Well, only if you know it's the network. Is it going to be change in potential energy? That one's easy because if the object changes elevation, you just put that in. Um, realize that if you use the change in kinetic energy, it implies that you're talking about the network. I get multiple forces doing work. Each one has its own power output, right? So if I want to know the power output for one of the forces, then I would say um, the work done by one of the forces divided by the time. But if I want to do the power output based on the change in kinetic energy, well, then I'm, I'm determining the net power output, the net power. Because if it, I'm talking just about changing kinetic energy, I'm talking about the net work being done. Remember, if I move an object up at constant speed and then it stops, it's get, I'd start from rest, end from rest, the kinetic energy of the marker didn't change. Kinetic energy didn't change, which means the net work done is zero, is zero. I did positive work, but gravity did negative work. You add up those two works together, you add up those two works and you get zero. So no change in kinetic energy. So remember that as well. All right.
Going back to this thing, we got an equation, power equals force times displacement times the cosine of the angle over the time. Let's say that you're driving in a car, and this doesn't have to happen, the cosine of the angle can always be in there, but let's say you're driving in a car, let's just make an assumption here that assume F and D are parallel. If F and D are parallel, cosine of theta is what? Same direction, angle zero. What's cosine of zero? What? If you don't know that, just put it in your calculator. So let's just make that assumption just for the sake of argument. So that's going to be one. It doesn't have to be, but I just want to emphasize something. So I have power is force times displacement over time. So I have a name for displacement over time. Huh? Velocity. So if an object is moving in response to a force and you want to know the power output, all you got to do is multiply the force and the velocity. So this is another equation that is not on your formula sheet, but that is sometimes useful. Force times velocity. And when you get to big kid physics next year in physics C, we'll call it the dot product of force and velocity. That's when we start doing some rigorous vector mathematics. That'll be next semester. Yeah. I expect to see all of you in AP Physics C, except for Taylor. Well, hmm? Are you a senior too? Yeah. No. Still well, the, the whole first row is a row of seniors. Well, that makes me sad. I won't see you either, Kurt. Okay. Any questions? All right, let's wrap it up with talking about the units. Units for power. Or dimensions, as uh, Mr. P likes to call them. I like to call them the units. The easiest way with any, any physics law, physics equation to figure out the power or the units um, is just looking at how it's calculated. Power is work divided by time. Or let me just use the more general. Change in energy over change in time. So the units, what's the units of energy? What, what's the units for energy? What do we measure energy in? Energy and work. Joules. So the units are going to be joules divided by seconds. So the units are joules per second. That makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. The rate at which work done is done, the rate at which energy is used, the rate at which your joules are being used. This gets a special name. Does anyone know the special name? Um, I saw it when I was the three, three lines means is defined as, by the way. What? I was looking stuff. What? I was looking at all, all like how this stuff works. What? It's a watt. Oh, watt. I was being silly. I knew that. Okay. <laughs> That's the watt. Usually we don't think in terms of, we don't think about that word when we're talking about going upstairs or cars going or stuff like that. We think of watts when we're thinking what? Electricity. electricity. When we're talking electricity, we think watts. But it's the same thing. Ele electricity, when you have a light bulb, that's, that's a 60 watt light bulb. That light bulb is using 60 joules of electrical energy per second. And you follow that, the generation of that electricity back far enough and you got things that are literally just moving. And it's the motions of those things that create the electrical energy that we use. So, so it is, it, it doesn't have to just be electricity. In fact, and your car, your car moving. The, the horsepower, right? Your car's engines are measured in horsepower. Is that what you're about to say? What were you gonna say? One horsepower is about 760 watts. And so if you're talking about the horsepower in your car, you're talking about the power output of your car engine. And, uh, and you can convert horsepower directly to watts. Okay. 
I, I don't. I, there, there's probably a reason. I don't know it though. Maybe Gavin does. Ask Gavin. Yeah. It's worth a shot. So we, we uh, abbreviate the lot with just capital W, which can be kind of annoying because very often we have equations with work as symbols in the equations, but then we end up calculating something measured in watts, which has the same letter. But the easy fix there is if you know what you're doing, the W in the equation is work. The W as a unit is the unit of measurement. So those shouldn't be in the same place. Right? Make sense? Okay. You might have seen this word. Anyone here pay the bills of their house? Hopefully not. But, uh, sometimes it happens. You ever heard of a kilowatt hour? Nobody? Yeah? So when you buy electricity from the power companies, you pay for the kilowatt hour. So usually it'll say like, I don't know how much. I don't pay the bills. Uh, 25 cents per kilowatt hour. We can sim summarize with that, kilowatt. They don't say watts because your average house uses a lot of watts. And so kilowatt just makes the number smaller because it's whatever the number is times a thousand. For an hour you can use one kilowatt? Yeah, yeah. One kilowatt. Yeah, so, so you can use one, so if you're, if you're, if you pay twenty, if you pay twenty-five cents, you can use a thousand watts for an hour. Yeah. I think that would make one house. What, what what you'll see, and there's there's a problem on the on the quest assignment for power where you actually determine what you'll find out is that to keep lights on, it's, it's very cheap. It's not expensive at all. Um, to uh, yeah, what 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 really are you paying for when you're paying your power bill? You're, you're, yeah, modern TVs are huge energy sinks. It requires air conditioning. Air conditioning is a big one. Air conditioning, and if you have a heater that runs off electricity and not natural gas, then heater, heating as well. But in Texas, in the summertime, your AC unit just sucks up the energy. That's why if your parents are frugal, they're, they're, they're like, we don't want to go way down too much because it's just going to cost too much to keep the house cold. Yeah, it's, it's huge. And then um, your refrigerator uses a huge amount of energy. Your washer and dryer use a huge amount of energy. Modern televisions, if you got the big 70-inch screen, those use a lot of energy. No, electrical work's being done. You got to... No, I'm Gas bulbs, you know, like literally what the energy is used to do? It's used to... to hit the electrons in the gas atoms, have them jump up an energy level, and then when they jump back down, they emit a photon, right? like you learned about in chemistry. So, so it requires energy to do that. Energy it uses. It's not like moving something big. Right. Like right. It well, it it's kind of moving electrons, but it's, but it's, not using, it's not that's, that gets massive. weird and way beyond the scope of this class. But anyway, back to kilowatt hours. Um, when you buy, what the thing is, is that a lot of students see kilowatt hour, and they think, well, that must be another way of talking about power, right? Because it has the word kilowatt in it. But no, this is a unit of energy. It just so happens to be a very convenient way of writing energy, calculating energy, makes it easier for the power company to charge you for the electricity. Why is it a unit of energy? Well, look, power is in units of joules per second, which I can also, I, I could equivalently call... Um, Kilowatts per hour, kilowatts times hours. Because if I have a joule per second, that's a unit of power, or a kilojoule per hour, right? I could take I could take joules. Let me write, let me let me talk about that. One. Joules per second. I can convert that to kilojoules per hour. That's still a unit of power, right? It's still a unit of work or energy over time. So if I take kilojoule per hour and multiply it by hour, what do I get? Kilojoules. Just kilojoules. Mm -hmm. right, if I take kilojoules per hour, which is a, a kilowatt, mm -hmm. and I multiply it by hours, then I get a kilojoule. So don't fall for that. There's a question on the quest assignment that's going to say, what are the units for power? Choose all that apply or something like that. 
So a kilowatt hour is not a unit for power. It is just a strangely worded and strangely calculated unit for energy. But the reason they do that is because it's much easier to measure and it's much easier to charge you for. Yeah. And it's good for the consumer as well because the more difficult it is to do the calculations and to sell, as, you, as Kurt pointed out, the more people they got to hire, the more people they got to pay, the more they got to charge you. Right? Well, you get, that's why you look at the meters, right? You got the meters on the side of your house that measure the kilowatts that you use. Okay. So, that's it.